Hello everyone. To celebrate Women's History Month, SUSE Women in Technology Network is excited to welcome you to our final In Conversation With. We've had five sessions. This is our sixth and the final one. Every week in March, we've been hosting an In Conversation With dialogue and each one has featured a guest speaker hosted by a member of our SUSE team. I'm so excited to introduce the guest today, but wait, before we get to that, each hour, we've been having a journey of resilience, resolve, creativity, achievement, and sometimes it's been really emotional as we ultimately unpack how our guests are breaking biases. We're going to start today with a 40-minute dialogue between our host and today's special guest, note two guests, and then we'll follow that with a Q&A. Please submit your questions in the control panel at any time during the session. Our wonderful team behind the scenes are going to pick up those questions. They'll share them with me and I'll ask those on your behalf to our guests and hosts. So today is my absolute great pleasure to introduce Beatrice Thirst. But you'll hear that I'll be calling her B henceforth. B and I work very closely together as B is in the office of the CEO at SUSE and she's a founding member of SUSE Cares, our philanthropic donation program. And it's through this program that our employees can support causes in their local communities. And they've been doing a lot of work, particularly around what's been happening in Ukraine over the last month or so. So with that, hi Beatrice, welcome, and it's gonna be over to you. Thanks Jenny, and thank you for the introduction. Hi everybody, my name is B, and I'm really excited to be welcoming you all to the final event of Women's History Month at SUSE on the final day of March. Unfortunately, um, the event bio says Claudia, but Claudia can't join today, um, but it's my honor to be hosting Dita Formankovo and Leopoldo Macias today. So to briefly introduce our special guests, Dita is the founder and chairwoman of Chaquitas, a charity inspiring and educating women and youth in IT and digital skills. Dita is also the director of diversity and inclusion and communities at Avast Software, and as well as that, Dieter's initiated multiple educational projects, including the Academy of Programming, Power Coders, and Data Girls. And on top of all that, Dieter's also listed in the Forbes 30 Under 30. So super inspiring and really excited to have you here, Dieter. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm also really excited to be welcoming Leopoldo Macias, someone who, if you're at SUSE, I'm sure you already know, Leo is the Learning and Development Technical Specialist at SUSE, and he's extremely and admirably passionate about passing a bright future through SUSE and technology, which is why he's founded the El Rancho SUSE Linux Learning Club. With this project, he's volunteering time to teach local high school students the amazing world of open source through open SUSE Linux. So welcome, Leopoldo. Thank you, B. So I'm super excited to be talking to Dita and Leopoldo today about reaching the younger generation. Um, and I think we should jump right into it because I know there's a lot of topics and there's gonna be a lot of questions to get through. So I'd love to start with each of your stories and hear more about what's inspired you to explore a career in tech and really bring you where you are today. So Dita, can we start with you? Sure, uh, well, uh... Actually, in the past few years, I learned how privileged I was when I was growing up because I was surrounded by great role models. Uh, my father is IT specialist and a real geek. And I also really loved math and, and physics when I was little. And I also had amazing female computer science and math teachers. And I was able to enjoy quite a nice hands-on computer classes and quite a huge support I received from my peers, including my girlfriends who were also um, studying math with me. So I actually end up graduating with a double degree uh, from system engineering and also applied computer science and started my very ambitious career in tech. But after a year, <laughs> so it was at the beginning of the story, uh, in 2013, I actually came up with a very simple idea uh, to bring IT closer to women. 
and introduce women to the IT industry because I didn't see many girlfriends around me when I was studying and when I started working as an analyst. So we started um, organizing workshops, uh, actually programming workshops for mainly our girlfriends back then, um, promoting lifelong learning and also the importance of uh, tech and digital skills for future success uh, and, and at the end, we actually managed to have some unicorns, uh, some, some women who actually transited their careers from being a bartender, for example, to being a developer. So we brought them from their first HTML uh, to the job in tech. And over the time, this is the Chekita story. Uh, so over the time, uh, the, this idea attracted a quite a strong community of tech professionals and uh, leading companies and volunteers, and it gave rise to very diverse portfolio of um, of actually educational concepts and has grown to quite a nice community, actually the largest one for in informal training in tech and digital skills and carry transit in entire Europe, inspiring and guiding dozens of women annually. But after seven years um, of doing this, of educating women into tech, I actually learned that the story does not really end in here because we need to make also sure that once the women enter the tech industry, they can grow, uh, they can grow there and they can grow all the way to the leadership. So last year I decided also to join Avast, a cybersecurity company um, as a director of uh, diversity and inclusion and also communities. And my main responsibility over there is to create a company culture that is diverse and quite inclusive to all. So that was my journey <laughs> and I, I guess I'm still learning very much um, and uh, I have a lot, a uh, lot to do still. <laughs> wow, that's so inspiring and when I was researching this session I also read that you were actually awarded the European Citizen Prize for your efforts to increase uh, technical and digital literacy in females so that's really, you know, such an inspiring story and a testament to the passion that you have for this topic. Leopoldo, what about you? What inspired you to explore a career in tech and, and bring you where you are today? <clears throat> well, it was by accident, really. And ironically, it was a, a young woman that pushed me into tech. Uh, and it's funny because that was my sister. So I was the oldest of four siblings and uh, my parents divorced. So I was the oldest and uh, the oldest man in the house. And uh, Basically, I had no future at that time, um, and I went to the military. And when I came back, I found my house, my my family in chaos, really. And I, you know, I didn't really think about the future much. I definitely didn't think about tech. It was more survival at that time. And I remember I got into a, an, a, an altercation with my brother, uh, and him and I were 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 having it were at odds. I know this sounds bad already. Too early in the morning for me to talk about this, but. It was true. And when we were in the middle of this altercation, my sister stopped me and she says, well, if you think you know what's best for us, why don't you why don't you do something? Why don't you show us if you think you know so much? So I literally the next day walked down to a community college and say, how do I start? Because I didn't know. I didn't have anybody in college. Uh, my parents didn't go to college. Uh, forget my grandparents didn't go to college either. But uh, none of my uncles or aunts or anybody, there was literally nobody I could ask about college. I didn't know what it, how it worked. Um, but I did know that my sister said, well, you know, instead of, you know, complaining, why don't you show, show us by example, I guess. And so I did. And, you know, that was step one. And, uh, and the reason I, I had to go through that route was because when, when I was younger in high school, I didn't know about college. So I didn't even think to apply to college. Uh, but when I finally did, um, <clears throat> and I got accepted, you know, somewhere in the area of New Mexico. Uh, when I went to my my mom, uh, who was single mom, by the way, and I said, hey, good news, I got accepted, so I guess I'm going to college. And I found out soon after that I have to pay for that. <laughs> and I really didn't know you have to pay for it. And as soon as that happened, she says, I don't know what you're going to do because we can't pay for college. And so I went to the military. Anyways, that's how I started my career in tech because I literally went to the community college only to show my siblings uh, by example. And when I went there, uh, basically I took some, you know, sort of a 
a test. They give you some test to see, you know, what your skills are, you know, what you might be good at personality wise uh, and, and other otherwise, I guess. And I guess it, it, one of the things that popped up was uh, engineering and software engineering for whatever reason popped up too. And I said, I don't know, computers seem to be around. And uh, it was when, this is probably uh, in the early nineties. So, you know, computers were not yet that that prevalent, but they were around. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll try that. And I literally just started taking one course at a time that led me into what ended up being a software engineering uh, degree at a four-year college. But to get there was <laughs> quite a battle. So it was by accident, to say the least. Uh, I really didn't plan this. Uh, and when that happened with my brother and my sister challenged me with that, you know, it catapulted me into this area that nobody in my family had been through yet. But in other words, even though it's this day and age, I was literally the first person to go to college. Um, and so there, when my sister did that and I sort of started making that journey to college, I was in a realm all by myself. There was really no guidance. There was no counselor that I knew I could talk to. There was no mentor I could talk to, no teachers that I could ask. I mean, it was weird because I just walked into a community college and said, Where do, how do I start this whole thing of college? And so luckily, uh, you know, maybe I was in alignment. It led me to the right places at the right time that I ended up where I am today. So that's the beginning of that story. And now you're at SUSE. I know, <laughs> and it started that day with the cat of my my young sister pushing me and challenging me. So ironically, uh, it was started by a young woman. Well, that's really awesome. And I think, you know, given we are in the last day of March, the last day of Women's History Month, it provides a really important opportunity for everybody to educate and reflect on ourselves, how we can work to create a level playing field for women in tech. Um, you've both spoken about some of the issues you've seen in the tech industry and some of the obstacles, and we're definitely improving. Um, I'm sure you agree if we compare to 50 years ago or 10 years ago, there's a significant improvement on the numbers of, of women in tech. However, there is still a lot to be done. Um, and I read a statistic that women still make up a very small percentage, just over a quarter of the IT and tech sector. So it's clear there's still a lot to be done. And it'd be interesting to hear both your thoughts on what do you believe is driving this lack of women in tech today? Um, and Leo, maybe we start with you. Um, I think for one, it's there's a lack of advocators for sure in the IT industry, uh, meaning that everybody that I've experienced in the IT industry is mainly just doing their job and they don't really pay attention to who's around them, right? Um, especially from the male perspective, you don't really realize until you're made aware of that statistic, for example. So I didn't know that that was a thing. Uh, but so I think there's lack of advocators out in that industry. Um, also, I think being part of women in tech now and hearing all of the stories that I've been hearing, there's a lot more pressure on women in an IT industry just because it's a male dominant field. And I know that. But there's so many things that women have to deal with that I didn't know. I have I have two daughters that I ask some of these questions about like you know they're the the silliest things that I that an, I never had to experience and I don't think most men have to experience which is when you get a job and you know your boss wants to friend you on Facebook and if you reject it that can cause an issue at your work uh, that's unbelievable to me and and when I ask my daughters about these things they're like yeah that's normal. And I'm like, that shouldn't be normal. Like, this is unbelievable for you to feel that kind of pressure. Not only do we all go to school, right? It's already hard enough to be in STEM. Engineering as a, as a degree is hard to follow. On top of that, uh, I realized that as a, as a young woman coming into a classroom that's dominated by male and, and obviously you feel like you're, you're different, right? And, and males or men not being able to sort of make that environment more comfortable, the pressure I think is too much that, you know, it's already bad enough to try to pass your courses, pass your exams, get that degree with these really difficult courses. But on top of that, you got to deal with the social pressure of, you know, I don't know, I, how do I say this, you know, but just men having to put in attention towards you just because you're a woman, not because you're a human, because you're a woman. And then some of those things are not okay. And so I think that that's just ends up being too much that they either drop out of that 
environment. Only very few women can take that type of attention or pressure that either, you know, they speak up or they have a voice or they, you know, they, they're focused. Uh, but there's a lot of women that could have done it too, but they may have been weeded out because of this environment that that's there. And so having a lack of advocators and men for women to make that space a safe space as well uh, as a pressure that, that they deal with that I don't think men have to really, really realize uh, is one of the reasons I think, um, which is what I'm trying to address with the El Rancho Sousa Club. We have women there and I wanna make sure that those sort of variables don't, I try to limit, it, limit, it, limit them as much as possible. And Dita, what about you? What do you believe from what you've seen um, with your experience? What do you think is driving the lack of women in tech? Well, actually many things. Um, uh, the first I would mention is the lack of access to uh, the engaging education and, and supportive environment when, uh, when our girls are little. And then, of course, they are they they face stereotypes that are enforced by media and, and bias, and and often they lack confidence. And at the end, what Leo also mentioned, they don't feel comfortable, uh, heard, and valued in very masculine environment. So this is why women uh, do not enter the field, but also leave once they are in it. So. I would say that there is no single isolated thing we should blame um, on a society level, especially here in the Czech Republic, um, as we are a very conservative society. Um, there's a lot of cultural stereotypes we inherited on the role of women and, and men about the typical jobs uh, that we should aspire to. But also uh, there are many individuals uh, we are meeting throughout our lives uh, that are influencing our decisions, uh, such as teachers, family uh, and peers. Uh, but when I look back actually to all women I met in our community, I must admit that it all comes down to the courage, the external courage, the lack of courage and lack of confidence. And on a, on a courage level, um, like I said, there are major, major, um, major differences in leisure time activities, um, preferences uh, of young boys and young girls. So girls um, are resulting in uh, getting less exposure to computers. And it does actually influence um, how they perceive computers and technology um, uh, and how they use, how often they use uh, computers. And as I said, also on a courage level, they we they really lack support and encouragement from their family and, and school uh, to go pursue careers in tech. And if they do, and this is what Leo was talking uh, about too, even if they do, they if they eventually end up working in tech, uh, they are actually ended up in a minority. And as as in any other minority, a member of any minority, they need to put an extra effort uh, to being heard, to be valued, and it's tiring and it takes a lot of time. Uh, so they need to constantly be proving their capabilities and can competencies. And, and the last actually bias or, or the lack of courage is that um, once women are around 30, they face something what we call maternity wall. Um, the expectations from their managers uh, or hiring teams to leave soon to deliver a baby. And uh, so, and it does prevent them to be promoted or even hired. And uh, on a confidence level, uh, when I talk to women, um, and it's very sad, but women are often raised to be nice and caring and boys are expected to take a risk and be brave. And therefore, women in general, um, they take, le take less risk. And uh, we can see that um, when women are actually applying for the job, according to the hardware study, the, the known study, um, women only apply for a job if they meet 100% of requirements uh, compared, compared to men who only need 60 um, in order to go ahead. So. Um, this is the this is what I would definitely highlight um, on on a confidence level. Um, that is a result of how we actually raise uh, young girls and what do we do, what kind of personality we expect from them. You know that if I can interject real quick, there's an interesting story that that brought to mind, Dita. Um, I think the Hispanic community where I'm from actually is is sort of the same uh, with some of the sort of built-in bias into the culture, unfortunately. But that's changing. 
But I'll, I'll say this story. Uh, there was a dear friend of mine who was a woman who took uh, an aptitude test in to enter college, and she she literally uh, got a test results, and the and the counselor who was a, a man, uh, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed. It was a man. I'll just say that uh, at a particular race <laughs> or or background. Um, <clears throat> anyways, so she tested to be an aeronautical engineer, and she says. This person told the counselor, yeah, I want to do that. And he's like, yeah, that's not for you. You should do secretary because you need something right now to pay for your child that's young. So she took his advice and became a secretary, ended up working at AutoZone, and she never flourished into the STEM field, all because one person said no. And it just baffles me of that type of advice. You know, it's like, how could you say that to somebody? Very few people in general can test into aeronautical engineering, aerospace engineering, uh, and and very few of those, very, very few of those have even had the courage to do that as a woman. And for her to say, yes, I want to do that. And he's like, yeah, you know what? No. You know, well, then she felt betrayed because it was flaunted in front of her as, hey, guess what? You can be an aeronautical engineer, an aeronautical engineer, but you should probably do secretary because you need a job now. And, oh, that really irritates me, that kind of a, a advice coming from a, a man, right? And that's that's something I want to change. It's like, no, that's, that's not okay. And by the way, I'm being your witness, you know, I'm telling this person that you just, let me validate you that that was not okay, what was done to you. She never went to college. And to this day, she doesn't have a degree. Uh, and, you know, it's been 30 years later. Well, and if if she was a a guy, that the teacher would have never said that to her. That's the... I know that's really upsetting. Uh, but I can only do one guy at a time. That's me. I got to start with myself, <laughs> right? <laughs> but 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 if I was there, I'd be like, "What are you talking about? What is wrong with you?" But yeah. So to go to what you're saying, Dita. Yeah, it starts early on, and and that's just one person that I know of. There's many of those stories that I've heard of where they're like, you know what, that, in fact, uh, there's so many stories like that, that I'm like, something's got to be done about it, which is why I got myself involved in women in tech, because no, that's not okay. Mm -hmm. And I think, to Dita, your point, there's, like you said, so many factors, some are on a more societal level, and then there are some like Leopoldo, your example of teachers or parents, people in these girls' life that these comments they never get forgotten and they go deep into their subconscious and that affects their whole life path because that one teacher said no why would you do that um so there's so many different factors um i think the societal one in particular is interesting because as a child you're absorbing so much you're you know watching tv reading books seeing the news and what we're exposed to as children really has a pivotal impact on what we then think is real life um, and I read that a classroom were once asked to draw a scientist, just draw what you picture as a scientist. And pretty much every child drew a white man in a lab coat as a scientist, because that's what they're exposed to in movies and TV shows. And, and that's what they're told scientists are, a white man. But in reality, that shouldn't be the case. Scientists should be a complete diverse range of, of different people. But that's not what we're shown when we're growing up and and that must have a, a huge impact yeah those the stereotypes uh, of that kind are just not useful and not good and i'm glad that you guys are doing something to change that with having sort of these kinds of uh, talks to bring it out to light really and for the men on this call it's something to know i'm sure it would have upset any guy to know that some other person would say that to an intelligent person uh, who happens to be a woman and said you know what no you should go be a secretary mm -mm. and we'll talk a bit um in a second about your both of your specific organizations that you're you're working on and working with these these women and, and students on but just before we park this topic, is there anything you found that you witnessed firsthand when you are working with these women and young students? Do you see any common challenges um, which explains this shift from, you know, young children being interested in science and STEM to when you're going to college or choosing a career that massively drops? Um, Dita, you mentioned confidence was one, but are there any other common themes that you witness? Yeah, well, as we 
uh, as we mentioned, it's it's all the media picture and the role models we are we are having access to. So throughout our peer networks and but also through Instagram and social networks. So how we see a scientist, you know, in the TV shows and movies. But what is really interesting a uh, study is that actually uh, when you look at the children at the age of 12, 13, you know, you see the same uh, number of girls and boys in a, ma in a class um, interested in computer science or math. But uh, young girls are actually losing their interest in tech careers at the age of 15. And um, as we mentioned, it's due to stereotypes, existing stereotypes, but also lack of courage uh, from their closest. Um, they, they lack support of their networks because it does influence their self-evaluation, evaluation, but also their future uh, career choices. Um, they sometimes um, lack access to mentors and, and someone who would tell, well, it's super great idea actually to go to explore tech if you are, you know, feeling quite confident and well in math. Um, you know, the only career choice if you are interested in math is not only economics or becoming a teacher, you can actually be um, artificial um, intelligence, you know, scientist, you can, because this is exactly, you know, if you have a passion in this field and if you are willing to learn, this is exactly what you want to do. And um, so this is what I would say, it's still a challenge. And again, I would stress um, the, the thing that um, as we only see, actually in the Czech Republic, it's, uh, there's an extraordinary challenge we need to tackle because there's only 10% of women in tech in the Czech Republic, which is, uh, which is making Czech Republic the worst in the entire Europe. And um, so women, they, they are minority, uh, so they are not often seen uh, and visible. And as I said, as every member of any minority, we, they need to put an extra effort. They need to work extra hard to ensure their voice is heard and work valued. And it, it like I said, it's tiring and it, it takes extra time and, and the sense of belonging is really low uh, due to the missing men mentors and, and networks. So there is definitely something we can do um, and creating networks is actually proving to be a great practice uh, to advance women either within a company, um, within um, employee resource group or uh, if women are engaged in some other leadership circles or uh, women in tech circles, it's really helpful. And if we start in a young age, it's even better because um, there's a lot of women we can motivate to go to study tech and do not lose them um, if they are really fancy about math, uh, if they are 12 years old. And I so think that, oh, sorry, Leo, you go. No, go ahead, B. The, you were asking about the challenges that I see mm -hmm. in, in where I'm at. Why well, I, I know the challenges that I see is that for the uh, young women having a voice. I mean, your vo the voice is so powerful. Uh, it, it's unbelievable. And I don't think a lot of women use that voice uh, in, it, as much as they should. And they'll, and they'll realize how powerful their voice is. And then, of course, the safe place. I think the challenge is having to, building a safe place where these topics are talked about. Uh, you know, so that's that's another thing that I think is a challenge is bringing making this safe place for women and men to engage in one place as equals. Uh, that's a challenge, uh, and I and so that's one thing that I notice as a challenge uh, for for the young women in in the Rancho Sousa Club. Yeah, and that's a, a really nice segue, Leo, into sharing a bit more about the El Rancho Sousa Club. Um, maybe you could share how you are inspiring your students and, and helping them overcome some of these challenges. Well, once again, by accident, <laughs> and really, <laughs> and once again, it was sparked by some young woman. In this case, it was my daughter. So my my daughter was uh, it was interested in tech. Yay, right? And so I'm like happy about that. <laughs> uh, but when she decided to take that step and take a computer club course, um, she, every day I would pick her up and I would say, well, what did you learn? Like, how did it go? And she was like, it was boring. And I'm like, what? It's like, that's weird. I go, maybe, maybe, maybe the stereotype's right. Maybe it's boring for her. But then when I found out well, what exactly is boring about it, she's like, all we do is we just sit there and they take racks of laptops and then they would just update them. 
just software updates. That's it. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. I go, doesn't she teach you like how computers work, how patching works or anything? And she was like, no, it turns out that this company was hired by the school to update their laptops so that they use the club to have the students do the update for them for free. My daughter was part of that and I was pissed. <laughs> and I was like, this is not okay. I mean, I was basically, I got sick and tired of, of young, you know, especially Hispanic kids being exploited and they can, we can do better. And so the Rancho Sousa club, club came out of an idea from that. And I said, well, let me, let me go talk to the school and say, you know what, Sousa is here, luckily, because there's not many local tech companies here in Santa Fe, uh, at least that's, you know, sort of as, as big as Sousa. And so I said, I talked to the school and I said, look, let me do it. Let me do the computer club. Let me teach them some skill that they can immediately have right now at this age. And so that was the start of it. And it be, it basically became uh, the idea start, stemmed from that. It was really for my daughter to learn Linux uh, and show that it's not just clicking a button to update software. It was actually patching. It was fun. It can be fun. It's not zeros and ones. It was, it's just a laptop that you can use. And, and from there, it's a skill that you can take to the workforce. Um, so it really has taken off. And I think because the good intention was there and it had a good idea from the start, right? It was, it was started from a good intention, not to sort of market Suzo or not to market myself or whatever. It was for them. And it really has shown uh, to the fact, to the point where it's spreading to other students who started to join our club <laughs> uh, and, and and many women have started to join that club because they're like, I had no idea it could be this fun to learn tech. So that's how El Rancho Souza started. That's awesome. And I've seen that you've also invite employees from all different functions and teams at Souza to, to talk to them and, and share more about what they do. Oh man, powerful stuff. Powerful stuff because it's, I think every every young person thinks that they're going through it by themselves and they're the only person that went through this trauma, whatever that is. It could be trauma, it could be an obstacle, it could be a hurdle that they can't jump. And when they see our mentors, you know, uh, Amber Washington has been there, you know, Nikki has been there, a lot of the women in tech, uh, Katarina has been there. Um, I've had some, some other men come by. It has been so, I mean, to, to for these kids to think there's no way I'll get out of, you know, Santa Fe to be exposed to people around the world. Cynthia Sanchez, who I think is from Argentina originally, and, and now she's in Europe somewhere. For them to see an example of different diversity of people and, and their backgrounds and their struggles, whether it's coming out, right, as, as uh, you know, their gender, whatever, or even men saying that you can do this, you know, cheerleading them on from people from Germany, you know, uh, these men that have joined our, our club, it has been just an eye-opening experience for them. And it's really given them the confidence that they're like, you know what, my world is not just here. I can go out in the, in the world and do something more than just what I thought. And most, most of them thought they were just gonna be hairdressers or mechanics or plumbers. No, the, Walmart, <laughs> JCPenney, you know, no, it, it, they, it really opened up their world to, to give them the confidence that they have more that they can achieve and it's outside of this small town for them. So anyway, sorry, go ahead, Dita. So I actually uh, did a question. I actually had a question to you, Leopoldo, because uh, I really uh, like what you said. Uh, we There is a leg of uh, advocators. Um, and uh, I do have a wonderful experience with Chiquitas, our community of volunteers and lecturers and coaches um, actually has uh, more than 600 people who are involved in teaching and guiding young women and, and older women to tech careers. But when it comes uh, to employer resource group, like um, I, I think it's super effective when you uh, have some personal story. If you have a daughter, you know, if you have your wife, you know, struggling with something you are more willing to help or you know how would you actually encourage the others to join such groups so they can see some of the experience and uh, so they can be inspired to behave uh, you know in in other way uh, and and to create a more inclusive environment in their teams how would you encourage people to join such groups within a company well i think sharing our stories like this right you sharing your story has inspired me to have more ideas <laughs> so and i think 
the more that uh, the more people that join these kinds of of talks and they're just talks not presentations this is just informal conversations when you start to hear the background um i think it encourages them to be like wow i had no idea so what i do is say come listen to this you got to hear this right <laughs> especially for the guys right i'm like you got to hear this can you believe that somebody had actually said this to a, a woman as far as guiding them you know this the story of the secretary and there's so many more like that I, you know, I think, especially if you're on this call, you're probably not one of those. And you can be like, wow, because I think even for me, I'm like, there's no way. I, I can't even believe that somebody would do that. And so I would say, no, you got to listen to this. And by the way, we need more people like you who are willing to listen to join these clubs and start your own maybe, or not just a club, but maybe just start advocating. And so all I have to say is listen to these stories and you'll be moved. Your real life stories, especially coming from the women's perspective, was fuel enough for me to do something about it. By the way, I think that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned from being in the Women in Tech. When you, what Amber did, for example, when you guys get together and you share deep, deep traumatic events and feelings and, and fears about that, yeah, I'm like, wow, now that's courage. And, and I really, and I don't mean to say that just to sound like, you know, cliche, I cannot imagine getting around with a bunch of guys and saying like, hey, you know what? I was really scared at that time. Or you know what? There was this one traumatic event that happened. I mean, men go through trauma too. We don't talk about it though. And so being part of, of the women in tech has allowed me like, you know what? What happens if I start to share, be transparent? And that's one of the things that helped me at the Rancho Sousa Club. I've I'm really transparent with my feelings uh, in class. With And what that means is that, you know what guys? I'm going to be honest with you. I just got off a call. I'm pretty stressed, so I need to calm down. So let's talk about something else. Or I'll say, you know what, guys, I'm really nervous. I didn't prepare, so I'm not sure what I'm about to do. <laughs> and it's funny how that sort of brings things down to a base level, uh, whether it's women or men. And they're like, I just I just say exactly what I'm feeling. Just tap in to that exact feeling, not, not the presentation of, I'm Sousa. I'm supposed to know what I'm talking about. I teach you, so therefore I should know what I'm doing and I should look like I'm always prepared. No, that's not how real life works, right? And so when I come to the to the club and say, you know what, guys, I'm really scared right now because I'm not exactly sure if this person is going to show up. And if they don't, I don't have a plan B, but we'll figure it out together. Then all of a sudden it becomes a safe place, a community where we're all the same. It's not about male or female or, or men or, or women. It's more about just people experience something at the same time. And it excites them too. They're like, oh, okay, well, you know, he's nervous. I'm nervous. Let's all be nervous together and let's just get through it together. So um, I think making that kind of environment makes, it attracts other people because it's, you know, this whole, I, I even I even go to Katerina and them and I said, you know, Katerina, like, what does it feel like to be a woman with a male, you know, sort of teacher right what does that feel like i have no idea what that feels like is it intimidating are you scared is it something that's hard to do i had no idea so i, I asked my students like hey what does that feel like so that's really what i want to learn from here right is i don't know what it feels like you know to walk into a classroom where there's a guy and there's another guy and there's another guy every single class is taught by some professor that's usually male over here um and i want to know and change that Sure. Um, Dita, I'd love to hear about Chiquitas and, and if you could share with the audience how you're working with younger women. Um, I know Chiquitas, especially for Sousa, is, is a charity that we all connect with um, because Sousa Cares, which is our employee philanthropic donation program, um, Chiquitas is the number one most nominated charity in that whole program. So it's a charity we all connect with here at Sousa. Um, and could you share more? A bit more about it. First of all, I we really appreciate the support. So thank you all, uh, employees of SUSA, <laughs> for supporting uh, the organization. So I'm glad we are moving to the positive side because there are some solutions. Uh, we can still fix the leaky pipeline, and this is exactly what Chiquitas is doing: um, fixing a leaky pipeline and closing a gender tech skill gap. Um, so. 
Here we come. Uh, with Chiquitas, we inspire, train and guide women to the future professions, which we call um, professions in tech. And as we are reskilling thousands of adult women into tech, um, we are actively enlarging and diversifying the talent pools um, in the tech industry. And also within a, our huge partners network, um, we are advocating for greater flexibility and, and because women, especially in the Czech Republic, um, um, they must balance their careers with childcare, uh, which is primarily dominated by women in the Czech Republic. So, um, so this is what we do, but the, the majority of our students with a successful story transiting to transiting to tech industry uh, are 20 plus uh, in their 30s or even 40 years old they are coming back from their parent leaves and we successfully actually built a community and extensive networks of women and IT professionals and also companies but uh, your question was about uh, younger women uh, so, regarding uh, young girls in high school, um, we are now collaborating with a few universities in the Czech Republic um, and on, on a few programs. The first um, is from, uh, was established in 2015. Uh, we developed uh, something we called IT Summer School for High School Girls. Uh, it's a one week long program during a summer holiday, um, holidays and we have actually quite a great success record in motivating participants to apply for a college uh, in the tech industry afterward. Uh, just spending a week uh, together, uh, exploring like what it really means to be working in tech, uh, giving them a taste of programming and uh, graphic design and robotics and they taking them uh, to the companies uh, where they can meet the actual people who work in IT industry, including women and 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 yeah and handsome men and you know they they see you know that stereotypes you know does not really play a role anymore and and also when it comes to young, younger um, children we as mentioned here many times we need to uh, show more role models re relatable role models uh, because showing uh, an exceptional woman somewhere across the ocean that is like 30 more years older than uh, young women, it might not actually build a confidence, <laughs> you know. So uh, we are avoiding, uh, we, we developed something we call Chiquitas Award and we are awarding the most outstanding uh, achievement in a college uh, by recognizing the best thesis uh, written by a woman uh, in computer science. Um, and it is all uh, accompanied with by mentoring in IT uh, company, so they actually can get a real hands-on experience uh, when they are still like 15, 16, or actually uh, 20, 21, 22 years old when they are in a college, so they can actually access uh, the company and, and enlarge the opportunities as they see like how the real job in IT can actually look like. Oh, that's awesome. And what you were saying about role models and your work in universities, the quote, you can't be what you can't see, seems to really ring true to that. We need people that look like us to be in those positions so that we realise that it is possible um, and that it's not a dream or something that can never come true. It, it is a reasonable thing to, to aim towards. I need to connect my girls to those clubs too. <laughs> it sounds like awesome. Awesome. Um, I am conscious of time because I know that there's going to be a lot of questions from the audience, but just a, a few more questions um, to go through. Dita, you mentioned a bit about the leaky pipeline and how it's as important to create workplaces that are female friendly and that include women as opposed to um, forcing them out. What are some things that you know we can all do in our workplaces um, individually and as a collective? To, to fix this leaking pipeline. It'd be great to hear both your thoughts on that. Well, we can fix the pipeline because um, there is something that plays really well into our cards and it's the technology industry that is actually totally influencing all areas of society, economy and culture and it shapes uh, the future of work. And today, 
everyone around the world is encouraged to um, to actually study and, and develop their digital skills in order to succeed in any kind of role. And plus, according to many studies, we need to be able to switch our career many times, you know, during our productive life. So I'm just saying to everyone on, on this call, uh, like it is still possible to go explore the career in tech. If still, if you are like 30, 40, 50 years old, you can still go and learn programming and become a developer. So now, you know, we, we are a lot talking about the young generation, but, you know, the, the reskilling and the careers in tech are also like, you know, uh, something that we can relate to if we are older. So we can encourage like all people, like uh, all our, you know, um, uh, colleagues and, and friends to go get interested in tech. But, you know, in general, what I would say, like if, you know, women, if we, even if we grew up with some bias and with some fear, uh, we can all take a courage to change it really. Um, as a woman, we need to train um, to, out, to be out of our comfort zones, to take a risk, to make mistakes, to, to speak up, and, and, but also be respectful to those who often act unconsciously. Uh, because I think, you know, many teachers and parents and those people who, you know, we heard, you know, in these stories, like they didn't mean any harm, you know, they, they acted unconsciously, right? So we need to be able to explain, like, what do we feel, you know, and, and what we want. And um, on the other side, like, you know, to we all who are privileged, um, we need to be better allies and better ad advocators. So... Um, there is one nice saying I really like, like, holding a door to women um, is not enough. We need to give them a microphone instead. Uh, because it was many, you know, it was mentioned also to Leo, like, we need to give them a voice. You know, it's like, we need to gentlemen, of course, we need them. <laughs> but at the same time, we need to give them a microphone. So I would say everyone, it's really important to help women with their networks. So within a company, outside, um, if you are a leader, it would be great if you sponsor women because sponsoring is the most effective actually way how you can actually help women to grow up um, in a career ladder <laughs> and, and then uh, encourage them and push them because, uh, you know, sometimes a woman just needs to hear, like, you know, just give it a try, go, go ahead, try that, you know, just go out of comfort zone and try to apply for the role that you now think that it's above your competencies. Just push them um, so they just need to hear some, some support and encouraging words. You know, Dita, talking about giving them a voice, which I completely want to, that's the first thing I'm trying to address at the high school level is like, look, you can practice your voice right here, right now. Even though you're not at the, you know, harassment doesn't start after college, <laughs> right? I mean, harassment starts, it's happening now. And when they have normal jobs here, whether it's at a pizza place or whatever, they can experience this. And I said, look, my my goal is to have mentors, women mentors come and talk to you guys so that when you're confronted with a situation where there might be some sort of harassment, you can be like, you know what? I remember I saw that at the club, the Rancho, at Rancho Sousa Club. And they taught and and you know this person said to say this, that will practice their voice at this early 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 in the stage before they go to the college before they enter the real workforce, if they can get their voice now by the time they get there, it, you know hopefully that fixes the pipeline because then by then they're like you know what I don't think that's okay I feel like I should be compensated compensated more for the job I do or whatever the case may be, but it's got to start off early and that's at least that's where I'm getting them early in high school. The other thing to do is is to consider for anybody on this call is consider that their voice may not be their physical voice. We need to provide platforms where if you're an introvert uh, and both male, I mean, men and women can be introverted, there's got to be a platform because one of the things I have found out and thank, thank God for, uh, you know, I think it was a sales summit uh, for SUSE we, where they introduced me to Slido. Uh, after I introduced Slido, which is a way to anonymously communicate with me in a classroom environment, all, you should see when I'm in front of the kids, they say nothing. I swear they're bored. They're like, I can't stand this class. I'm bored. I even started bringing in snacks and I'm like, look, what it, what can it take to get you guys to speak up? And I swear, I'm like, man, I must be horrible at this job. 
But as soon as I brought in Slido and they started to communicate anonymously, wow. I mean, it was night and day difference. Every single person was like, I really love what you're doing. Thank you so much for doing this. And I'm like, why don't, I, why don't you say that in person? But now I realize having a voice also means accommodating for those who don't want to speak up with their voice, but they want to, they have a lot of things to say. And so having a, a platform like that has really made a difference. So uh, a voice can be in other ways, not just presenting or speaking up, uh, but maybe providing other platforms to do that. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I think I can speak to everyone on the school. This has been so inspiring and, and so insightful. Um, and now I'd like to pass on to Jenny, who should have some audience questions, um, which we can go through as well. Jenny, you up. Oh, hi, Jenny. Lovely. Thank you, B. Thank you, Leopolda and Dieter. We do have some questions for you. And I, there's a question here. I'm going to dive straight in, Dieter, to you because you spoke a bit about the challenges that you faced and you also talked about you know, growing up in a very conservative um, society and community. Can you share just a little bit more about the challenges that you faced as you began your career in tech? Well, I'm going to be uh, probably answering on behalf of women um, in a community as I personally uh, am very privileged. I didn't uh, experience any story that would discourage me from pursuing career in tech. But what I see, um, you know, especially in the Czech Republic, like I said, we have a couple of extraordinary challenges. Um, the first, I would say, uh, is the fact that uh, um, women are often encouraged to pursue other careers uh, that in STEM based on a leisure time activities and there are some careers that are you know that you are supposed to be doing as a woman and uh, as opposed to men um, so that's why you know uh, you don't really see um, uh, women or girls involved in computer classes um, you know when they are 16 17 18 19 uh, and it results um, you know there is only 10% of women in tech, but it's getting better. This is what I wanted. I really wanted to sound positive. <laughs> so it's better because when I started with Chiquitas, it was 2013. We had only like, I think we had only like 9%. I had 9% of or 8% of female colleagues in a college. But now there are 17 to 20% of women who are studying uh, tech um, computer science degrees and and somehow like stem uh, going to stem careers but uh then extraordinary ch challenge i would say that is very typical to czech republic it's the it's the increased burden of unpaid care uh, which is disproportionately carried by women in like 90 percent uh, predominantly uh, we have women who are on on maternity leave and the maternity leave even though it's so beautiful we have this choice we have this choice is you know it's almost like four years or four, four years so it actually creates extra struggle when women are coming back to the market because we also like um, childcare facilities and uh, the capacity of childcare facilities that would actually uh, help us to balance work and childcare. You know, there is not many uh, flexible uh, jobs. Um, you know, some of the companies are really ahead and, and accepting, you know, the, the flexible model of working, uh, including the hours, the, the you know, the, the place. Pandemic really helped so we can work online, but still, you know, uh, there are majority of roles you see are for full time. And it's just like, it's impossible, you know, for women if they have a little babies, so. Wow. You know, it, it's funny. I, I want I, you to I, be positive. <laughs> no, no, that, that's good. But it, one of the things that I tell myself when I talk to young women is, First, acknowledge I am not a woman. And I know that sounds obvious, but it's not because the mentality of a man, like you can really, you can never say, I know what you're going through. I do not. Just that right there alone, having a choice, whether if you want to have, you know, if you want a maternity, right, a, a choice of pregnancy. I don't have that choice. I don't know what it feels like to have that choice. And so there's a lot of things, there's a lot of pressures around that too as well. So I want to say that uh, when I first say I'm not a woman, I can never understand what it feels like to be a woman. I can only try to listen and learn as much as I can, but I could never be in those shoes. In other words, if I think if men acknowledge that, 
I, I challenge them, right? Ask your daughters, ask your wife, ask your friends, any women in your life, like, you know, tell me about your work environment. Tell me about your school environment. How does it feel to go to work? How does it feel to have a, a, a male teacher? Like, does that do anything to you? Does it intimidate you? What does it do for you? I, it's interesting. Those simple questions that we just take for granted, uh, I think go a long way to helping us understand that, well, I didn't know that. I had no idea. Or how many Facebook requests you get, how many social media requests you get, and you 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 denied my request, and I'm your manager, and how dare you, and what's wrong with you? It, it's like, no, nobody, nobody ever asked me to join social media, <laughs> and, and nobody, there's definitely no repercussion if I, you know, say I reject them as a friend, but apparently it's different uh, for the women in the work world. So, uh, you know, as a challenge, I would say just have that conversation with the women in your life, whether it's your mom, whether it's your sister, whatever, and just ask them these questions, because I'm telling you, it's really enlightening. And once you hear the stories, you're going to be like, I can't believe that happens. So, but going back to what you were saying, Dita, I don't have that choice. I don't know what it feels like to have a choice like that uh, of, you know, being, you know, have, I don't know what the word is, but child, having children, you know, for guys, obviously that's not the same as for women. You know, if we do happen to have a significant other and we want to have a family, you know, it doesn't affect guys as much as it does. It's a bigger choice for women, I think. Um, so we have to understand that. It's a huge difference. Yeah, you both shared some really powerful messages there. And um, I mean, the good news, as you say, Dita, thinking about the positives of what you explained, I mean, yes, we, we know there is still a battle that we need to, to fight, but it is nice to hear that things are changing and things will continue to change. And, you know, we can all be part of that change. And actually thinking about that, there's a question here where someone's asking about being a mentor and what advice would you give to others on how they can help to enact change and be part of change through being a mentor? And maybe you could say a little bit about that first, Dita, and then Leopoldo. Yeah, I think Leopoldo actually said it right. You know, you just need to go and ask and listen, I guess. And, and I think women, uh, you know, if they are in a safe environment, uh, meaning it's a network, um, it's employee resource group, whatever circle it is, you know, they are able to come up with a list of things that needs to be changed. And and so I would say the first is just to go and ask and, and, and they are gonna be able to tell what needs to be changed. And especially if you're a manager, so there's a lot of systemic bias in the process, in, in the processes and in the systems, in a Company. So, um, and so we need to be sure that there is not only like individual bias, but also the systemic bias. And this is the most hurtful, hurtful thing. And then I would say uh, the the best mentor is someone who help um, other women to uh, get connected with someone. So, so it's someone who is enlarging their networks. Uh, so it's enlarging the opportunities for career development, for any other development, uh, connecting with other role models, someone who might actually share some some of the experience and, and problem solving, etc. So someone who will introduce uh, the women to some powerful uh, people and, and networks. This is how you can actually help women. Well, thank you for that. And um, I'm going to ask for a little bit of indulgence here. I've known B for the last two years, and here's an example, B. Tell us in the last couple of minutes just a little bit about how you found your way to tech, because clearly you're here and you're definitely of the younger generation, and we know that it's not necessarily a natural choice. And also, we don't all need to be able to code. So tell us a little bit about why you're here in tech and your journey at SUSE. Yeah, you're putting me on the spot, Jenny. I thought I was just going to be the interviewer. <laughs> um, I think similar to Dita, I I fortunately had you know a very privileged position where I've not felt um, so many obstacles. I've never been told you know why are you doing science or, or why are you going into the tech industry. Um, it's always been something that's interested me. I I love the industry and the agility and fast-paced nature of it as a whole, and so it's always been something that has attracted me. I think as well going to uh, all girls school for later on in my education definitely helped because you know I wasn't attending a science class and being the only girl in the room and just being loads of boys because I can imagine for the girls that do go through that at school and at university that 
that must drill down slowly and slowly into confidence um, and make you question if that's the right place to be. Um, but yeah, so I think I, I feel very privileged in my journey to tech and that I've not had those obstacles that, that so many people do have. Um, but I think there's still a lot of progress to go to help those young kids, boys and girls, that don't think they are able to pursue a career in tech, but that they can. Um, and I think Leo and Dita, both your organizations are you know, so inspiring that you're doing just that and, and encouraging people to believe that it is possible and, and that you can. Well, thank you very much, B, And thank you, B. Thank you, Dita. Thank you, Leopoldo, for today's session. Can't believe that we've actually completed our time with the audience today. And whilst we're saying thank yous, I have to say a big thank you to everyone as part of Women in Tech who are behind the scenes, because there's always a team and a village with bringing together events like this. So April, who's been both behind and front of camera, Natalie, Katerina, Nikki, Andrea, and Sarah, You've all been working behind the scenes to help bring this series of In Conversations with to mark Women's History Month. So a big thank you on behalf of the audience and for everyone at SUSE and for everyone that's actually joined us over these sessions. And do look out on social media for details of recordings. And with that, we bring our series to a close. So thanks, everyone. Thank you to the audience. And we'll see you for the next session. Bye thank for you, now. Everybody. Thank you.